really when I was I was 12 and actually it was just about four or five days after I became homeless and I had left my, my father's uh, house and gone out to Rochester uh, was when 9-11 happened. And at that time, I wasn't awake enough to know what I was looking at. I was, uh, um, you know, still very naive about things in the world, but I started to develop kind of a, a patriotic fervor um, over the years. And I really thought that I could, um, you know, go and be a part of the machine and change it from within for the better. And, um, you know, I, I thought that I was serving the values of America and that the military was an elite um, and moral and ethical force, which is, you know, not exactly the truth that I would learn over the years. We are recording. Welcome, everyone, to Prove to Me That You're Live Lightcast, the only show in the world that challenges your perception on reality and life and gives you a mental kick in your spiritual gut so you can start gasping for air of information like you did when you were a little kid. Oh, man, today. Today we have a blessing, ladies and gentlemen. To have Today we have a super unique uh, human being. Um, when I first When I first heard this guy, I'm like, uh, he was talking, he was talking, but he was on some uh, Witsa Gets a channel and Witsa Gets it was trying to get him to talk about Flat Earth. And he was like, look, the way I believe the world is that it's based on our perception, because if you look at quantum mechanics and everything like that, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, dude, this is something I made a video on like years ago. My mind was blown. I started looking this guy up and I'm like, I'm like, this guy is amazing if when if when we're gonna have a president like the guest that i'm gonna introduce is that means that we're in a good state that means the country is going somewhere good so without further ado i have uh a future president an inventor an awesome dude all around man patrick riley man patrick riley. i wish i had clappers here man but um welcome welcome to the show my friend how are you today you're a living legend in my eyes because uh we're gonna get into it but little do people know people like you you're like the unsung hero you have done so much for the regular population and you are doing so much for regular people man my mind was blown when i started you know looking you up man so how are you sir i'm doing great and i appreciate the warm intro of course um uh it's always a pleasure for somebody to you know observe the things you've got to say and then actually see the value behind that um so i'm i'm honored to be here and uh, looking forward to getting into it thank you so so much i cannot thank you enough because again you know i tell everyone that comes here you didn't have to you could be anywhere in the world today but you actually came here and you know what uh, the cool the cool thing about this uh show is that we we just kick it man we talk you know we have a conversation but today is all about you. Uh, we want to know who Patrick uh, Riley is. And uh, my first question is, you know, before the inventor, before the presidential elections, who are you? Where? Because I couldn't find this information. Where are you from? What was your childhood like? What were some of your heroes? Who made the man that is sitting in front of us today? Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a great and complicated question. Uh, so I come from a pretty tumultuous past, um, kind of a, a very broken um, and abusive environment early on in childhood, you know, youngest of five siblings in uh, a uh, house with some addiction and abuse issues. And, um, you know, from, from the age of three to seven, you know, watching my parents divorce and that type of thing. Um, my, uh, my mother was uh, Pentecostal and rather uh, um, quite aggressive in that practice. And my father came from a background with uh, um, crime and uh, having been a Vietnam vet that was uh, uh, coming back to an America he didn't know and, and joining into a crime syndicate and uh, becoming, um, you know, basically a, uh, a lifetime uh, 
a difficult lifetime that no one would ever want to grow up in um, or experience themselves. Um, for me, I was born in 89, so it was kind of long after he'd uh, left some of the organized crime and started doing other things. But uh, most of the the trauma was still there, and I was kind of the, um, the youngest product within that. And uh, um, by the time I was 12, I became homeless and uh, moved uh, to the area of Rochester, Minnesota. And, uh, you know, I, I bounced around quite a bit, did a lot of uh, waiting tables and uh, uh, car washes and things like that. Well, I put myself in, in middle school and some high school and wow. got a GED at 16 and joined the army by 17 so I could uh, get out of there and I, I became a combat medic. And uh, while I was a combat medic, I went on to uh, finish college and actually ended up earning my master's in forensic psychology and an MBA from Syracuse University, wow. uh, as well as becoming part of civil affairs and psyops uh, for the, the last uh, five or six years of my career. Um, many deployments and uh, many um, missions in support of special operations in Southeast Asia and uh, the Middle East, as well as uh, some in Central America. So I, I really shaped into something else entirely from where I started. Um, and then uh, in 2021, once the vaccine mandate came down, I, I knew enough from my background to know that I would have been violating us code 2381 if i had taken that vaccine mm. so in that i i decided it was time to get out and i was able to retire with a med board um from the military and avoid the vaccine and i launched uh, a company on the xrp ledger uh hosting a a new economic system and uh, that has grown over the last uh, two and a half years into seven different companies and seven different uh, products offered um, that hopefully will change the world someday in their own way. And uh, throughout all of that, I, I'd been inventing. Uh, in 2009, I was blown up in Iraq and I had a, uh, a head injury and, and became an acquired savant um, and started inventing. So some of those inventions have been works in, in progress for about 15 years now. And uh, I just recently in Cape Canaveral was able to reveal the first four of of those designs, um, which are also hopefully going to change the world for the better. Um, after I got out, as, as you alluded to, I ran for president in 2024. Um, it only ran a couple months. I wanted to see what the gates were and see what was preventing a normal person from achieving such a, a lofty goal. And I did get my answers. Um, but uh, I'm here for the fight and I'm, I'm still fighting. Listen, you just blew my mind, man. And this is, I guess, you just said something. You know, I guess the ether is real because what you, the early part of your life that you said uh, is actually very similar to mine. I just want to say, man, congratulations. You know, um, it seems like you've, when, when I wrote you and I said I wanted to document your incredible journey, this has been truly an incredible journey. And you're so young. And if I must say, you have this kindness in your eyes, man, you know, like, uh, and it's so good to see. We really need people like you, you know, uh, running, running the world, man, so to say, you know, not running it, but contributing into the future and to the future generations. Did you have brothers and sisters uh, growing up? I did. I had uh, two older brothers, two older sisters. Uh, I was the youngest of the five. So, um, there, there was some good things and some bad things about that. Were you ever uh, in contact with your parents again after you ran away? Uh, so my my mother I hadn't seen since I was about seven years old. I, I saw her for about an hour when I was 12 um, due to like a court mandated thing. And then uh, she actually reached out to me just a few months back from now on Facebook and added me as a friend. So we, we've been talking a little bit, you know, um, 25 years, 20, and uh, more than that, 20, 20 some odd years changes a person. So I don't think she's the person she was um, back then. And uh, my father, uh, once I turned 
17 and joined the military. He tried to make some amends with me, um, and he passed back in 2019. Oh, wow. I'm so I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that sometimes when you don't have a relationship with like a family member and there are things that were perhaps unsaid or uh, undone, it's, sometimes it's even harder than someone passing that you've been close to uh, the whole time because I kind of also had a similar thing. Um, so I'm sorry to hear that. And once again, man, congratulations, man. What a freaking journey, man. And I wish you, I wish you all the best, man. May you keep going and just uh, taking over the world, man. This is this is so beautiful. Um, so, did you get adopted at, at one point after? No, I I um, never had the desire to be, and you know, I, I was pretty independent by the time I was twelve years old. So I really bounced around a lot. I would crash with friends, sometimes crash with my brother. I uh, I had cars that I would acquire. Uh, tactically from uh, places that I thought they would not be missed and I would stay in those at times and um, at, there was points where they tried to put me into you know a social service system and tried to put me into uh, you know group homes or uh, foster care which never quite panned out um, so I, I would find myself leaving those shortly after being put in those um, but ultimately I, I don't think I did half bad in the end Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think we hear enough about your journey, man. I'm so thank you so much for sharing that. It's so it's so important to me. You know, I think that we usually in society, we like put labels on each other like, oh, that's a police officer. Oh, that's a politician. That's an inventor. But uh, I always like to get the human being before everything out, you know, because we're at the bottom of it. We're still a human being, you know, like and we all have these stories like the one that you just shared. So how old were you when you joined the military? I joined at 17. It was uh, June 12th, 2006. So I was uh, 17 and a few months when I left to the army. What, what, made, you, what made you join the military? And what branch of the military? Uh, so really when I was, I was 12, and actually it was just about four or five days after I became homeless and I had left my, my father's uh, house and gone out to Rochester uh, was when 9-11 happened. And at that time, I wasn't awake enough to know what I was looking at. I was uh, um, you know, still very naive about things in the world, but I started to develop kind of a, a patriotic fervor um, over the years. And I really thought that I could um, you know, go and be a part of the machine and change it from within for the better. And, um, you know, I, I thought that I was serving the values of America and that the military was an elite um, and moral and ethical force, which is, you know, not exactly the truth that I would learn over the years. Mm -hmm. But uh, those were my ideals when I was a, a young, naive 17-year-old uh, boy. We can go back into the military because I think that's so interesting to hear a perspective from someone someone uh, like you that has been there actually and done it. Um, one question I always ask my guests and I would like to ask you, um, was there a turning point? Was there a shift in your perception of the world? Like, was there a certain moment or did it happen gradual, gradually where you started kind of opening your eyes and realizing well oh, maybe the world is not what uh you know what it seems um I, I would say the shift for me really started in about 2014 um and and the reason wasn't most people's story of you know they started following conspiracy this or that um <coughs> not judging you if that's how you got here mm -hmm. but um for me it was because after my head injury and i had the um you know, the, the acquired savant syndrome, I started doing my engineering and I realized that I was going to need funds. I was going to need money to make any of these inventions a reality in the way that I wanted to see them uh, come to be. So I had to find out how to make money and I had to um, you know research where was there actually any gains that were worth making and it wasn't the stock market, it was blockchain um, and Bitcoin. And then, you know, I really started learning Ron Paul and Robert Kiyosaki and uh, you know Robert Gunderson and and uh, 
really, as I started to learn about the money and follow the money, it became very apparent to me of, of the corruption and where the corruption was and, and the larger picture. Um, and that's really how I woke up to everything was not through the, the theory or the, um, the suspicion so much as the observation of, of raw data and numbers. Mm -hmm. So for you, uh, you would say it happened gradually. There wasn't like a certain moment when you were like, "Uh huh," like something crazy is going on. Yeah, that's fair. <clears throat> yeah, that that's pretty interesting, man. Because you're right. I guess a lot of people uh, hit their awakening through some sort of a what we call a conspiracy. <laughs> uh, so that's interesting. So how long were you in the military? It was sixteen and a half years. All said and done. Whoa holy moly so you're there wow you're there for a long time man so what was your experience like um you're coming into the military is 2006 i believe we are still in iraq yep. um uh so what what was your experience what what are some of the things that you've seen where have you been uh in the world like because you said you eventually ended up in iraq so what was that whole experience like man yeah, so I, I mean, initially when I went in, I, like I said, I was very naive. I expected um, everyone else in the military was there for uh, morals and ethics and values. And so I was actually, it, it's a little bit embarrassing to talk about, but I was so naive that my mm -hmm. only real vision of what the military was like, because I didn't grow up around it. Um, my vision was basically Mulan, where you had the... Uh, the big army training in tents and out there eating mm -hmm. out of the big pot of rice and saving private Ryan were, and uh, full metal jacket. Those were like my entire vision of the military was based around basically those three movies. Um, I didn't know you got paid to be in the military. It, it wasn't even a thought to me uh, when I went to join it. Um, so then, you know, once I got there, there was things like your your shopping list that you were supposed to go out and buy things for what you needed for basic training. Mm -hmm. And some of those items were mandatory. Some of them were optional. And some of the optional items were things like locks for your, your wall locker. Mm -hmm. And being a 17-year-old kid that thought this was all about morals and ethics and values, I was like, why would I need a lock for my wall locker? nobody's going to steal my stuff. We're all here for the same reason. So I was, I was dumb, naive, dumb. <laughs> um, so when I, I went and, uh, you know, completely avoided buying it, no one did steal my stuff because they all thought my locker was unoccupied because no one could be that dumb. Uh, so that gives you kind of an idea of, of how I was when I joined. And I quickly realized that being highly motivated and being morally and ethically motivated didn't, translate into promotions it didn't translate into better treatment it didn't translate into uh leadership positions being 17 being um frankly scrawny and and skinny um <coughs> you know i was regarded as a young kid for really the first five or six years i was in the military i was still regarded as a young kid even mm -hmm. while other people who were older and had been in the same amount of time were you know, passing me up in rank and things like that. So I, I kind of quickly saw that uh, the the squeeze wasn't worth the juice that was coming from it. But as I uh, as I ended up in Iraq in 09, I, I had, you know, quite a, a group of winners. And I say that sarcastically that I was attached with. I was on uh, General Mendoza's PSD or personal security detail as his wow. um, assigned medic which was a position I volunteered for. And um, we had a group of about 20 other troops that were all, you know, his escort that would take him around and meet with, you know, leaders of different areas of MND North or, or you know, uh, Mosul or, or whatever it was, right? So um, with that group, about half of them within the five years after the deployment ended up in jail or dead for various reasons that were immoral or unethical. We had guys wow. trafficking in uh, drugs. We had a guy that was stealing about 60 motorcycles and got picked up. Wow. We had uh, we had one soldier, Joseph Alfred Garcia, was my driver throughout Iraq, and he went away for 12 counts of child 
uh, sexual assault uh, after he got to Fort Carson. So I quickly realized that the people I'd surrounded myself by were not there for morals or ethical uh, reasons, but more so that the military was just a, a microcosm of the greater world of America. And many of the people were there for uh, selfish and, and, you know, individualistic reasons. And it wasn't something to necessarily be proud of in the way that most people think the military is proud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Um, this, this is so mind blowing because when you're telling me your story, I'm thinking to myself, here's a kid that went off by himself. He came from like a broken home. Where do you think that you found your morals and ethics from because it seems like to me throughout this whole time you have these building blocks of morals and ethics like you have this mission in mind where the whole world around you is not like that you're basically what we say in ukrainian i'm ukrainian we say you're a white crow amongst black crows where do you think that came from in internally 